And today I wanted to jump on and talk with you guys about really truly getting well versed in identifying toxic behavior. And there's a reason for this. Because as recovering people pleasers, all right, you have to think about what we've been through. We're people pleasers. We have put up with so much. We have accepted the unacceptable. We have been manipulated. We have allowed ourselves to be manipulated. We have been talked out of what we're seeing. Okay, we have been talked out of our own intuition sometimes. And I feel as a recovering people pleaser, it's really important that we get well versed on what toxic behaviors are so that when someone else comes along with that type of toxic behavior and they start acting a certain way to us that we really truly know that's what we're seeing. Because a lot of times people who are dealing with toxic behavior have to go and talk to their friends and they're like, you know, am I seeing what I'm seeing right now? Because we're not used to, <clears throat> because we're used to being talked out of it. I remember one time when um, one of my girlfriends did something very dastardly with my second husband, with my tsunami husband. And, and I remember, you know, after this thing happened, I looked at my husband and I was like, what the bleep? And he was like, he goes, you know, no harm, no foul. Don't worry about it. No big deal. And he kind of shrugged it off as it wasn't a big deal what she did. Then I later talked to one of my girlfriends and she, and this was like years and years and years later. And she said, oh, hell no. She's like, no, she doesn't get to do that. Like that is literally being disloyal and infringing on your marriage from this thing that she had done. And I was like, I said, you know, I thought so. <laughs> I thought so, but I was being told not to speak up, not to ruffle feathers, no harm, no foul, no big deal, you know, all these type of things. So I'll tell you guys the story since um, I'm already telling it. So, and I might've told this already on another live. I don't remember. I can't keep track of stuff. So you guys are probably going to hear the same stories here and there. So my girlfriend was at the house with me and my tsunami ex when I was still married to him. I don't remember the scenario whatsoever. I just know that she came to our house and she had already been drinking. I don't know if we were headed out for something. I don't know. But she had been, or she was just stopping by on the way home from a date. I, I really don't know what the story was. I don't remember. But I remember standing in the kitchen. And my tsunami ex had to go get something out of the room. And he go, we were talking about something. And he goes, oh, I'll go get that. He goes, hold on a minute. And he took off down to his, our bedroom to get something out of the room. So I'm still standing there and we're just standing there. And finally she goes, my friend goes, oh, I'm going to go too. And I remember she's intoxicated and this is going to be relevant. Let me tell you what she was wearing. She's five, six. She had very long legs and she was wearing big, like four inch heels. So that makes her like five, 10 or something. So, you know, her waist is very high and this is relevant and she's in a mini skirt. Okay, so um, she walks down the hallway and follows my husband down the hallway. And I'm like standing in the kitchen by myself thinking, what am I doing just standing in the kitchen by myself? <laughs> this is my house. So I, I start, you know, traipsing down the hallway to, you know, just join the, the people in the room. Right when I come around the corner, I mean, this is like instantaneous, you guys. Right when I come around the corner, my husband who was squatting on the ground to get something out of a drawer. I can't remember what it was. At that same exact time, he grabs the thing, he stood up and he's turning to like head out of the room. Right then she throws, remember, she's about 5'10 at this point in a mini skirt with big heels on, throws her leg up on my wall in a mini skirt, blocking my husband in the room. Now, this is my tsunami ex. This is probably the only thing he didn't, that he didn't do wrong. <laughs> but um, it wasn't his fault. But maybe it was. See, I don't even know. Maybe they had a thing going. I don't know, right? Because he was kind of, mm-hmm. So I walk around the corner right at the, right at the exact time that she throws her leg up on the wall. And he just is kind of, you know, a little shocked. It's, it's again, it's instantaneous. And I go, what are you doing? And she goes, oh, hoo-hoo, hee-hee, drunk, 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 laugh, laugh, laugh you know, you know, flops down the hallway. And I look at my ex-husband. He was like, he pulls me into the bathroom in the hallway. He's like, no big deal. It's not a big deal. Blah, blah, blah. In hindsight, 
Based on other stories, I think there might have been a little, mm-hmm. I think something may have gone on behind the scenes with these two. I don't know. And I'm just going to leave it right there because I can't prove that. She and I aren't friends anymore for obvious reasons. But anyway, my point is, is that that was, that was unhealthy and toxic behavior. And here I was, smart cookie, owns a business, you know, great with finding, you know, all the things. And here, <laughs> Jason. Right. It was a huge deal, but I was like, oh, it's all right. And I just kind of, I could just kind of shrugged it off because my ex-husband told me to. So this is why I feel like it's important that we have these conversations that we really get to know what is okay and what's not okay. Because too many times we're accepting the unacceptable. We're being talked out of the unacceptable. We are being told we're crazy or somehow it's being turned around on us, whatever it might be. So I feel like we need to have a really good foundation. Like honestly, and, and some people might be going, that's a little ridiculous, Kristen, because people should know. They don't know you guys. I didn't know. I knew that was wrong. Like it appeared wrong, but nothing really happened. And I was told it wasn't wrong. And she was drinking. You know, I just, it just didn't red flag to me it it did but then someone said put your flag away and I went okay so I think it's important that we get to know like really what's going on because we cannot set and maintain healthy boundaries unless we absolutely know what we're seeing because many times we're dealing with toxicist toxicist <laughs> I'm gonna have a sip of my decaf with that one hold on y'all Mm -mm. we're dealing with toxic or narcissistic people and they have this way of manipulating us now before I get started I do want to disclaim this that not all toxic people are narcissists okay a lot of us you know as I read this list to you guys as we go down this list you might even notice that you have had some of these things on this list and Oh, you mean what she was doing, Jason? Jason said it's grooming or teasing for the next romp. See, yeah, we're going to have to have a um, conversation about that at some point because that's kind of what I, there's something up. It was weird. Like it was very weird. Anyway. All right. It doesn't matter now. But um, so the reason why I wanted to talk about this is that not all, not all toxic behavior means a person is a narcissist. However, if it is imposing on your energy, if it's imposing on your free will, if it is harming you in any way, if it is doing anything like that, if it is affecting your well-being, then it's going to require a boundary. And one of the hats, one of the masks that I know is a mask now, I mean, it is and it isn't, let me just get there, that I wore very proudly was easygoing girl, which means, you know, oh yeah, I'm amenable, I'm easygoing, sure, whatever, do whatever you want. Like I was really super easygoing about things. But the problem with this is that I was putting up with things that I shouldn't have been putting up with for far too long, okay? Mm, Gray's kind of pretty. I'll leave it at this color for a minute. Okay, so I was putting up with things for far too long, way longer than I was than I should have been putting up with things because I was just, oh yeah, and I didn't want to ruffle feathers. I didn't want to rock the boat. I didn't want to do anything like that. So the reason why this is important is if any of you are out there and you're dealing with a person in your life that is not tar narcissistic or toxic, then it's important that you understand what exactly is happening here Sorry, you guys, I'm having a little technical difficulty. It says my AC is on, but it's rolling hot. Don't know what's happening. Let's see if this will take care of it. Anyway, it's important that you become well-versed in these behaviors so that you, you, you're not tempted to be talked out of it. That is the most important thing because your boundaries are the what you put in place to protect and preserve your sacred self. They are designed to take care of your well-being. 
So even if you're just letting a little bit of something come in from someone else, it's still something. And even though it's this person might be doing this, but this person's doing this, and this person's doing this, and this person's doing that, all of that is going to weigh on us. Now, we don't, <clears throat> we don't become super great at boundaries out of the gate. Hold on. <clears throat> we don't always become super great at boundaries out of the gate. It's going to take some time for us to really get good at them because we're not used to setting them. And I want you guys to give yourself grace in this process because recovering from people pleasing is just that. It is recovering. All right. The reason when I wrote my book, The Recovering People Pleaser, why I did not call it The Recovered People Pleaser, which actually was suggested to me by someone. And they kind of really pushed that because they said, well, you're past this. You are recovered. And I'm like, no, I am not recovered. Because there is still this peace inside of me, even though I know how to set and maintain healthy boundaries and do all these things, there is still this part inside of me that wants to fold sometimes, that wants to give in, that wants to not set a boundary, does not, that does not want to uphold my well-being. And I have to be super conscious about it. So although I am, I am doing the things that I need to do, Yes, I am not actually allowing myself to be walked on anymore by anybody. That's done. It's still a work in progress for me. It's still a recovering thing. You know, I think it's kind of like they say, you know, are you really ever a recovered addict, right? Where they call you always an addict. I don't want to claim that. I don't want to claim I'm always going to be a people pleaser. I don't want to, you know, I feel like when people recover from addictions, they should they should be happy and they should boast and talk about being recovered from that addiction rather than saying I'm always an alcoholic. <clears throat> I don't believe in that. I think you, you were one and I was a hardcore people pleaser and now I am recovering. I'm in recovery, which means the majority of the time I'm really great at this. Sometimes I'm not, but the majority of the time that I am. So I want to talk to you guys about the toxic behaviors because a lot of times these behaviors can go unnoticed. And that's what I think is most important to understand here is that these behaviors, they go unnoticed because only some of these are going to be like really standing out to you <clears throat> as super toxic because they're not the things like gaslighting and calling you names and you know these things that that are undeniably immoral or wrong or mean or whatever they are okay they're they're not going to stand out like that you're going to know that you're not enjoying them but it's not you know the typical what people would call toxic or abuse it's not that typical thing okay now some of you might think that they are and that's okay but it's important to know what these things are so that as they come up for you, you can self-evaluate. Is this harmful to me? Is this toxic to me? Is this causing a problem to me? Is this infringing upon my free will? What is this actually doing to me? Okay. Now, much, <clears throat> sorry, you guys, much of what I'm going to talk about here like I said earlier, are things that you guys might recognize and you might even done yourself. And if you've done it yourself, I don't want you to go like running, you know, screaming down the street thinking that you're a toxic person because the people that are typically watching this are the people who are trying to understand who toxic people are. Yet, I often interchange the word toxic with unhealthy and unhealed, okay? So just because you might recognize one of these behaviors does not mean you're a narcissist or, or a toxic person. It, it, might, it will, however, indicate a place that you might need some healing. So this is one of my favorite things about the healing journey, you guys, is that self-healing journey, is that the more that we become aware of our own behavior and the, and the things that are dysfunctional within us, the things that are unhealed, the faster we heal. One of the biggest problems is people want to ignore and not look at themselves. 
They're so ashamed of the behavior, they want to ignore it. <clears throat> they don't want to look at it. They want to know it's there. They're not going to admit that it's true. They're, they're going to make you wrong. They're, no, 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 that didn't happen. They're going to lie. Lying happens a lot when people don't want to look at their stuff. Okay, all that's unhealthy, unhealed behavior. But it also becomes toxic because then it's harmful to you or you're harming somebody else. So when I say awareness is key, I mean to tell you guys, awareness is key. It's key. Just becoming aware of who you are. Just becoming aware of how you're acting. Just becoming aware of the ways that you may be de being destructive in your relationship or harming your relationship. Don't judge yourself. Just become aware. So as I read through these, if you notice these things, <clears throat> write it down. I'm recognizing this in myself. This is me. I see this. Now I've got all these other amazing, gorgeous, beautiful gifts and talents and traits. And I got this thing right here. This is my growth point. This is my growth point. This is where I get to shine right now. And this is my growth point. Just like learning spelling words, right? First we, were, we learned cat and dog and all the three letter words. Eventually we're learning ubiquitous, right? We're learning really big words. So we, we set that foundation under us. So if you have a few things that you recognize, don't beat yourself up about it. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about is that, and, and, and oftentimes these things are really excessive. It's not in minutia. Okay, so if someone's doing this a little bit of a time, that's normal, that's typical, that's human beings. When these become actually toxic is when they're excessive. That's when they become toxic because a little we can all handle a little bit of a little bit. Okay? Like when someone's doing a little bit of something here and there we're like, "Yeah." Right? We can we're resilient, we bounce back from that. We can it may just, you know, suck a little bit of our energy out of us for a little bit of time, but it doesn't drain the ever-loving hell out of us, right? But over time, we can get packed with mud. You know, a little bit of mud comes at us, all right, you know, we can brush that off. Another little bit of mud, you know, a couple weeks later, we can brush that off. But when we got this mud flying at us all the time and we're just absolutely buried in it, that's when it becomes a problem. So the first behavior is that can be potentially be toxic is they take everything personally, which means their feelings are easily hurt. Be mindful that I said take everything personally, okay? Or the majority of things personally. There's, there's times when people say stuff and we're like, ah, what, oh my God, I can't believe you said that, right? We, we get it. And they're like, oh, I didn't mean it like that. And we're like, yeah, it's all right, whatever. We kind of, you know, let it go. But there's times when no matter what we say, someone's feelings are hurt. That person's feelings are hurt. Like you can't go, oh, the sky is blue. And they're like, oh. And you're, you're like, what? Or you know what? I think I'm going to, I think I want a hot dog instead of a hamburger. Oh. Now it may not be that dramatic, you guys. You know what I'm saying? But you will recognize this because it happens all the time. Like they're constantly getting their feelings hurt and then they're pouting or they're mad at you or they're acting angry or they attack you back. Okay. Which is the second toxic behavior, potentially toxic behavior, which is highly defensive. Now we're born to defend ourselves. That's how we stay alive. And we have a part of our brain that is wired for us to actually defend ourselves. But when people are hyper defensive, like all the time, like you cannot even have a normal conversation that involves any, any type of constructive criticism or a something, some feedback regarding them and they're not piling over you and barreling over you and getting their feelings hurt and getting defensive and turning it around on you, okay, that's destructive and that is toxic behavior because like I said, to get a little bit of defensive here and there or to feel <clears throat> the need to defend yourself here and there, that's normal. Sometimes we got to defend ourselves if someone's coming down on us. It's, it's normal and healthy and necessary to say, whoa, 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 you're getting this all wrong or you're seeing this wrong. And that's, that is healthy defense. Okay. But when people are constantly like, I mean, I had a friend that if I said anything even remotely opposing to what they were doing, this person was defensive and it wasn't even about them. Like I could be telling a story about, oh, you know, I 
whatever, tell some story, but if it reminded them of something to do with them that was the opposite of that, all of a sudden they would be dis- defending the, the counterpoint of that. Out of the, and I'm like, what are, you, what are you talking about? So there was like this defensiveness that constantly was coming at me and I, I had no idea what was happening. It was like, why is this person constantly defending? Okay, um, the third one is that they anger easily and they raise their voice. I got a huge problem with this, y'all. I got a big problem with this because I was raised in an environment with a screaming father. <clears throat> he was, <clears throat> sorry you guys, he was either silent or not saying much or he was frustrated, angry, and raising his voice. And it was extremely toxic. He's not a bad human being. My dad, hold on, I'm just going to make another drink. He was not a bad human being. He loved us. And especially as I grew older, I realized how much. He just had some unhealed wounds. Like I said, toxic behavior leads to unhealed wounds. I'm sorry, unhealed wounds leads to toxic behavior. So that's really what this all means. But if you got somebody that just pops off angry like all the time and they're just mad and they're yelling and they're raising their voice and they've got, you know, very little emotional quotient skills, like they're not in touch with their emotions and they just spew whatever emotion all over you. That's when it becomes toxic is when you are affected because people are allowed to be angry. Anger is actually very servant emotion emotion. And we need to be grateful because it tells us where things aren't okay. It tells us what needs our attention. So anger is fine. We don't want to worry about anger. When anger becomes toxic is when it is spewed out onto other people and becomes verbal abuse. Okay? And I think it's really important that people get well versed in that. That anger in and of itself is not is not bad because I've had people say to me, Well, I was so angry and they're so ashamed. So angry. You know, I know I shouldn't have been that angry. I'm like, whoa, bro, slow down. You're allowed to be angry. You're allowed to be fucking pissed. You are allowed to be angry. That was not okay. That was a betrayal. That was whatever the thing was. That was not okay. And you're not allowed to express it on other people. So when something like this happens and you feel yourself getting angry or your person is getting angry, Okay? When you feel yourself getting angry, express it in a healthy way. Okay? Go let that energy out of your body somehow, some way. Get the anger out. They have rage rooms for this, which I love. Or you could go scream into a pillow or hit some pillows or just do some, go boxing, do something that actually gets that rage out of your body if you're a person that's like this. If you're not, if you're the recipient of this, then you need to be willing to set and maintain healthy boundaries when it happens, which, which is likely to walk away. I will not be the recipient of your anger. I did not cause this anger, so I'm not going to be the recipient of this anger. When you can calm down, go express your anger. I want to hear you. I want to listen to what you have to say. I will, I will be here for you. I will hold space for you to, to work through this thing. And I cannot be the recipient of your anger and your yelling and your toxic voice. All right, the next thing is extremely judgmental. This is something that people might not see as toxic. And again, it's excessive. When it's excessive, when it's all the time, it can be toxic because we're all judgers. We're all here to, again, to take care of ourselves and we are assessing and discerning and judging our environment all the time and that's okay. But when people are judging, it's like so-and-so should do this or should do that or um, you know, it's, it's constantly everybody like just sizing up and having a judgment about how everybody's doing it wrong. Now there's a difference between noticing things. Okay. And having judgment. Judgment has some funk energy attached to it. And this is why I talk to people all the time about getting well-versed in energy and how things feel to you. Because Someone just talking about someone saying, yeah, that's really unfortunate that, God, you know, I just really wish they would learn to stand up for themselves or something. It's really different from, that person is so weak. They can't, and it, you know, see what I'm saying? There's a different energy attached to it. But if you've got someone who is constantly judging everybody or, or um, 
you know, someone comes on the screen at, on the TV or something, ah, that person, look at their this or look at their that. You know, if this is continually, this is a very toxic behavior and it is indicating something inside that person. So highly judgmental. The next one is controlling or smothering. Again, we are human beings. We have an ego and the ego wants to control. The ego wants to keep us safe and it wants to, it wants to control. So the part of us that wants to control is, is normal. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? Um, the, path, the healing path, the actual spiritual path, is learning to let go of control and surrender and to allow things to unfold. So when I say there's nothing wrong with it, there isn't. There's nothing to judge about that, yet it is better serving when we get into the flow of things. So we all control, but again, when it becomes obse uh, excessive, when people not only are trying to control their own environment constantly, but they're trying to control you, all right? They're trying to control where you're going, what you're doing, what you're thinking, what you're saying, what, you know, they're all up in your beeswax. That's when you know it's controlling, okay? Again, it's an excessive amount of this. And the next one is lying. Now, lying sucks. Lying is... <laughs> I was raised by a mother, y'all, that said to me, I mean, she hated lies and she would like get in our face and she'd be like, I hate lies. And she would say it like even worse than that, like she was some kind of scary witch. And so we'd be like, okay. So we were, we were told, we were taught to tell the truth and I'm really glad that I was and I'm really happy about that. But a lot of people weren't and a lot of people were not in safe environments growing up, so they tell they, they learned to tell lies to get, to get out of things so that they didn't have to suffer the consequence of something. Sometimes that was actually a survival mode. Like they actually needed to do that because the consequences would have been dire. Sometimes it was just a manipulation strategy that a child learned how to get their way. But at any rate, lying is never cool. Lying is not cool because if you want a healthy relationship, you got to be brutally honest. I am, you can ask my husband, I, you ask me a question, I'm going to tell you the truth. You ask me how I'm feeling, I'm going to tell you how I'm feeling. You ask uh, my friend Jason that was on here earlier, he will tell you the exact same thing. I don't lie. There's no reason to lie. Because when people are lying to us, we are not dealing with reality or the truth of what's happening. Why bother? Why bother even trying to fix a problem if there's lies involved? It actually annoys me. It actually makes me mad. <laughs> If someone's lying because we're not, I'm spending energy and effort to fix this thing, to, you know, to work this out with this said person, but I'm, I'm not dealing with the truth. Like, oh, I hate lying. Oh, Jason's here again. Yeah. Hi. Oh, I hate lying. I'm not dealing with the truth. I'm dealing with some thing that's out here in La La Land. No, give me the truth. Don't worry if it's going to hurt my feelings or you're going to feel, I'm afraid <clears throat> you're going to feel like this or feel like that, trust that I can handle my own feelings. I got me. I got me. And a lot of times people lie too because it would hurt their feelings. If someone said the truth to them, it would hurt their feelings. So they lie to you because they're projecting that it's going to hurt your feelings. Now granted you guys, sometimes when someone lies to us, it is going to hurt our feelings for a minute. If it does, I'm to the place now where I, I very, it's like, I have stopped judging myself and healed my inside so much that I, I like, I, I want to say I almost never get my feelings hurt. Like, it's just, I know me, I love me, I care about me, I accept me. And when we do those things for self, that is when we, we, we stop getting our feelings hurt because we already got ourselves. Because the truth be known, it's the unhealed wounds within, it's the judgments within that when someone says that's when our feelings are hurt because we're already judging ourselves. Okay. If we don't have that judgment there and so, like someone could walk up to me and say something mean to me, if I'm thinking that about myself, I'm going to be like, Oh my God, I can't believe you said that. If I'm not thinking that about myself, I'd be like, wow, that's weird. It's weird that that person sees me that way. Do you see what I'm saying? You guys. So anyway, lying sucks. Lying is the worst and, and lying is toxic behavior. It's absolutely toxic behavior because it is harming other people. And I would hope as adults that we only white lie where necessary because I do believe in white lies. And what I mean by that is if you know that something's just going to cause a massive amount of drama and it really doesn't need to and 
withholding from that truth. And believe me, you guys, I have played with this my entire life because it was pounded in my head not to lie. But there's just been times that, you know what, no harm, no foul to just say, you know, hey, I can't come to whatever because I'm sick. When the truth is you don't want to go because you hate somebody that's going to be there or you have a problem with that person. You know, I'm not, I'm not even making up a good example. You guys just get what I'm saying. Sometimes it's just okay to just to beg off of things as long as you're not this, you know, hardcore radical liar all the time. It's, it's okay. Little white lies here and there. And I mean little. I mean like little fruit fly white lies here and there. But if someone is constantly lying to you and they're not being honest with you and they're withholding the truth from you, that's toxic. And a lot of us, again, like I started this off with, we put up with way too much for far too long until we're just a shred and a, shred, a shell of what we are. And we're looking now at this relationship and we're like, I don't even, I don't even know what to do with you <laughs> because there's so much crap and it's just, you know, but here's what we do. Here's what we always do. We get really, 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 really in touch with self. And that's why I'm giving you guys this list. Okay. Because what happens is that we've gotten, we've allowed our person to confuse us. We've allowed the narcissist or the toxic person to wreak so much havoc, right? We're trying to reason with them and we're trying to convince them and we're trying to talk to them. Uh uh. Here's what works with a toxic or narcissistic person, you guys, period. Boundary done. Boundary done. Boundary done. Boundary done. And when you show back up, when they're like, okay, I get it, and you show back up and have a conversation, and the conversation at first, and they're, it's, the conversation is going good, then all of a sudden it turns a little bit, boundary done. You see what I'm saying? This is why recovering from people pleasing and healing ourselves from the inside out is going to change our experiences. Because sometimes, is sometimes we do not want to lose certain people in our life that are exhibiting toxic behaviors. Hi, Beverly. Is therapy a good idea? Um, yes. Okay, here's, here's what I got for therapy. And I'm just going to be honest because Kristen Brown doesn't lie, like I just said. Therapy with a conscious, wise therapist, okay? Not just someone who went to school. The best mentors for us are people who have gone before us and prevailed, okay? The people who have done what we have done and prevailed. This is why coaches and mentors are so important. I will hands down any day talk to a coach and mentor who has been where I'm at. They have prevailed from where I'm at before I would talk to a therapist. But that does not mean that I'm discounting therapy because there's a lot of amazing therapists out there. So, yes, therapy will help you if you have a conscious and wise therapist. I've heard some of the most amazing things come out of therapists' mouths. My therapist didn't do that. I went a couple times here and there to a therapist and it was like, what is this? You know, I mean, in fact, they told, they were siding with my narcissist and he was a hardcore narcissist, cheater, abuser, and, and, and was, she was siding with him. So I have not had great therapy, but I do know this for sure, that anytime I have owned my own behavior and I have applied radical self-love to it, which is forgiveness, grace and forgiveness of self, respect and protect of self, um, compassion and acceptance of self, supportive self-talk and self-care. Anytime I have, a, I have done that to any wounds inside of me, I've healed like that. Because this is the festering underbelly of why we're showing up in tox, as, as toxic or as destructive is because we have these wounds. They just need to be brought to the light so they can be healed, okay? Now, sometimes people have um, chronic fears and anxiety and they're stuck in survival modes based on massive, massive, massive trauma that was hardcore. You might need a little help with that, okay? And that's okay. Um, a lot of times, lower T trauma, just the things that really embedded in us, lower, I call it lower T trauma. A lot of my friends at Wisdom call it that too. Um, that type of trauma, we... Well, you know, first of all, I would never want to assume that you can heal anything by yourself or that you can't heal anything by yourself. So this is about going within and asking yourself, what do I need? What do I need? Do I need assistance here? Or can I apply these concepts to myself? I'm a self healer. Like I said, therapy let me down. I'm a self healer and I've done a lot of this through spirituality. 
through applying, like I said, self-love concepts to me and those things healed immediately. It was the miracle cure. That's why I call it the miracle cure in my book, which I hope you guys are getting ready for and getting excited about. It's called the recovering people pleaser, a spiritual guide to reclaim your true worth and attract the love you deserve. And that's coming out very soon. All right. So let's move on. The next one is selfish. All right. Again, why am I listing these things? Like you guys are like, duh, Kristen, that should be toxic. No, because a lot of people are selfish and they're not toxic. A lot of people want their own way. and They're not toxic. A lot of people are centered in self and they're not toxic. Okay. I'm very centered in myself. I know what I need and want at any given time, but I'm also a give, excuse me, a giver. I'm also a lover. I'm also very generous. And I also give, you know, attend to the needs and wants and desires of my loved ones, people around me. You can ask my friend Jason, who's on here, you know, when he wants to talk, I'm like, you bet I'm there, you know, anyway. So, but selfish means that they're doing it all the time. Again, this list is about excessiveness. If you've got someone that it's always about them, here's what's interesting, you guys. I was in this relationship where the person was being very selfish and I didn't know it. And this is why I'm sharing this stuff with you guys right now. Because I'm not selfish. I didn't, I, I couldn't recognize it. I didn't know what it was. I knew something was weird. Like I felt argued with all the time and I felt, you know, I just thought they were argumentative. Until one day a friend said to me, that's selfish AF. And I was like, and I started to see it. I'm like, oh my God, that is exactly what this is. This person wants it all about them all the time and gets mad when it's not about them. Gets mad when they don't get their um, short-term gratifications all the time. I was like, okay, it started making sense to me. So this is why I say to you guys all the time, we're so innocent. We're like these little innocent babies walking around trying to figure this stuff out. And I, this is why you need to give yourself grace on this path. Because here I am, couldn't even recognize a selfish person. Come on. I'm decades into this, right? I couldn't even recognize a selfish person. Then when I started to recognize that, I was like, okay, this makes perfect sense. So selfishness. The next one is jealousy and insecurity. I don't know about you guys. I've been jealous before and I've been extremely insecure. Was I toxic about it? No. Was I walking around wreaking havoc? No. Was I blowing people up or doing weird things? No, but I was definitely jealous and insecure. That has been in me. Okay. I've dealt with that. So this is why I'm saying with this list, just because you recognize something doesn't mean you're toxic. It's the excessive amounts of this. So if you've got someone that's like gel, oh my God, there's a family. Okay. I can't remember. I can't, I'm not going to mention publicly who it is, but someone in my immediate circle, like my, my family, extended family, I'm going to call it, um, jealousy, like ridiculous, like over the top type jealousy that their spouse put up with for so long. And it was, and it was of course stemmed in their insecurity and their, and which was stemming to the jealousy, which was promoting the jealousy. But it's like a little bit of something here and there. Someone's a little jealous or a little insecure or, you know, like a joke every once in a while, like, you know, you didn't answer the phone last night. Are you cheating on me? You know, no, of course not. Okay. Ha ha ha. And then like, it doesn't ever happen again. Or maybe in five years later, you know, it's okay. That's normal, necessary, healthy, because we do want to bring the things to our partners that we're nervous about, or that we have a trauma that we're trying to heal. We got a wound inside that we're trying to heal. It's important that we, that our people become aware of this. Okay. If they're not aware, they don't, we're just acting weird. And they're like, what the bleep is going on with you? They don't know what's happening, but you'd be surprised how many people want to show up for your healing. Okay. So we have to, we have to let them know. So if you do, you know, if, if you're like, you know, I was, I was, you know, worried about something, I don't know. And you, you tell the person whatever you were worried about. And then they can be like, oh my gosh, and they can help set your heart straight. And then you can go, yeah, I, I can't believe I thought that about you. Um, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm not, not going to do that again because I know that was just ludicrous, but thank you for talking me through it. See, that's a healthy thing. But if you've got someone coming at you constantly, 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 and you're going, dude, 
you know, I call everybody dude and bro. It's not gender specific. Okay. Like settle down. What's going on here? You know, and, and they're constantly doing this to you. That's toxic behavior. All right. That requires a boundary. That requires, I'm not talking about this again. If you think I'm cheating, then I'm cheating. You go figure it out. I'm not talking to you about this again. Do you see what I'm saying? Like we have to get more firm with the toxic people in our life. So many of us are just wishy-washy and that's the people pleasing aspect inside of us. We got to get firm with them and say, this is enough. I'm, Mama not playing in that anymore. I'm not doing that anymore. And I've done that with, you know, the people I love the most in my life, right? It's usually who we're doing, who, who requires these boundaries are the people that we love the most in the life, in our life, because they're the closest people to us that are doing this to us on a consistent basis. Sometimes it's friendships too, don't get me wrong. It can be friendships. It can be, um, you know, our close girlfriends or guy friends. Absolutely. Oh, by the way, this is so funny. I heard on Great British Baking Show last night, some guy referred to himself. He was the boyfriend. He referred to himself as the boy fee. Have you heard of that? The boy fee? B-O-Y-F-E-E is the way it looked on the screen. He called himself. He goes, well, since I'm the boy fee, of course, he's got the British accent. And I was like, new word. Okay. Anyway. All right. Let's move on. Jealousy and secure. Um, the next one is blaming others in the victim mentality. Oh, this always draws to mind to me one particular friend. God love her. Um, not a bad human being, but the victim mentality was through the roof. It was poor me, poor me. Everybody's doing me wrong. I'm constantly, you know, done wrong. I mean, the amount, the amount of done, done wrongery that was happening in this person's life blew my mind because <laughs> there's no way, you know, I got a lot happen to me. But it was like every day, like 10 people did her wrong every day. It was the person at the store. It was the person on the phone. It was the brother. It was the this. The de- All day long, people were doing her wrong every day, every stinking day. And I was like, you know, at first I was like, wow, that boy, that sucks. I'm sorry for you. I'm going to sneeze. Hold on. <laughs> sorry, you guys. You know, at first I was like, oh, wow, that really sucks. I'm sorry for you. Or God, really, they did that? But then I noticed that this went on and on. And it was the same thing every week. And the following week and the next month. And then I had friends of hers calling me going, um, yeah, I can't hang with that anymore because she's still talking about the same thing she was talking about 20 years ago. And I was like, so this is what I talk about with, um, thanks, Jason. <laughs> There's a little delay with my chat I'm noticing. Thank you, Jason. Um, so my whole point with that is that when they're constantly blaming, it is never their fault. Do you know how unhealthy that is? The, the number one thing that I had to do for myself to reclaim my personal power was to take radical responsibility for everything. That's what you guys are hearing me do now. I, you know, I had to take responsibility that I stayed in physically abusive relationships. Let's call a thing a thing. Okay. I stayed. I have a broken nose because of that. And I stayed, right? I stayed with all the people that were doing all the things. I have to own that. I have to own that I was the common denominator. I have to own that I didn't think highly of myself and therefore I was attracting men to me that that would, or I'm sorry, didn't value myself. I was attracting men to me who didn't value me and girlfriends. I had to own that I wouldn't set, that I couldn't maintain a boundary. And I'm going to throw some innocence in there too because I didn't really know you had to maintain a boundary. (laughs) I knew you had to set it. But, the, you know, there's actually the maintenance involved. I always say this, that when words aren't working, actions will. So you got to do that. Um, you know, I had to take radical responsibility for all of this, right? But I was in victim mode. Boy, after my tsunami, I was in victim mode. And I was looking, to, I was looking into the abyss of victim mode, like, and I had a reason to, be, to feel this way because I had been victimized, right? I was betrayed. I was left homeless. I was all those things. And there was a backstory of a lot of this in my life, but I looked into that abyss. Like this was a vision in my head, you guys. I literally looked into what looked like a well, like you'd see a well on a, um, on a farm or something. I, in my head, I was looking into this abyss and it was like so dark and unrelenting. I knew that if I went in, that I would never come out. I knew that I would be bitter, resentful old hag if I went into that thing. 
and I stepped back from the edge and I said, I'm claiming victory. It was literally in that moment that I said, I'm claiming victory. I will not allow these people who have done these terrible things to me that I did not ask for, that I did not cause, because any of these things, right? And oftentimes people pleasers don't. We're not doing anything that's dastardly, okay? In fact, we're the overgivers. We're doing a lot of things that are right. But I was like, I'm, they're winning. They're going to win if I walk around for the rest of my life pissed off and bitter. And I was not going to do it. I was not. That's like, no. Very, very headstrong with that. I was like, no, not doing that. And I stepped back from that and I claimed victory. And I looked at victory in my trajectory and I'm like, I will be you. I will be there. You just hold on. I don't know what I need to do to get there, but I'm going to get there. And I did. And I did. And you guys can too. So that constant victim mentality where the pe people are blaming, 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 and you're just like, dear Lord. Okay. There's got to be some degree of ownership. A lot of times victim mentality people are actually blowing things out of proportion too. They, it's excessive. So, and the very last thing I want to mention kind of falls under the controlling, the, the controlling um, arena, which is smothering. Okay. Smothering smothering there's you know especially if your partner is codependent if you're both codependent this that means they just got to spend a lot of time with you all the time because you're their safe space and they got to make sure that you're okay and you know because if you're not then they're not going to be okay and you know like there's just all this dependence going on there and and they want to be with you a lot and they're up your ass and it's like oh my god right it's it's my dog <laughs> my dog wesley is smothering <laughs> He is literally, that's where I came up with the term up your ass because when I walk, he is like, his nose literally is like touching my butt or the back of my legs. Like he's, he's literally right there all the time. And I'm like, Wesley, get out of my butt. It's like he's, and I don't mean it in a way like he's actually in my butt, but he's like, he wants to be, follows me from room to room, room to room, room to room. And if you've had a person in your life that does this and may not literally room to room, but they just are like, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? Where are you going? What are you doing? Can I go? Can I go? Can I want? No, why don't you stay home? Why don't you? you know, they're constantly, they don't give you any freedom. That's toxic. That's unhealthy. Again, needing your person, having a bad day and needing a soft place to, to fall sometimes, putting your head on them and saying, can you just put my head in your lap today? Or can you hug me? Or, you know, can just the two of us go together together to to dinner tonight instead of everybody else. You know, those type of things are normal. But it's the excessive when they're up on top of you all the time. Really struggling with identity is finding a red flag right now. Ooh, okay. I want to hear more about that, Trinity. Um, you're having difficulty identifying a red flag in your life right now. If, um, if you could maybe write a little bit more to let me know if that's a question, I don't know if that's a question or if it's a statement. If it's a question, go ahead and write more. If it's just a statement, then, um, okay, yes, we'll talk about that in a second. But smothering. So the smothering aspect is where they are, you know, they're just, they're just all over you all the time and you can't breathe. And human beings value, I'm sorry, I'm being distracted by the cutest little quail family right now. <laughs> it's running across this parking lot. It is the cutest thing ever. Anyway, so what it is is that human beings value freedom. We value freedom. That is like one of our highest values. Every human being values freedom. So um, why do you think jailing or you know incarcerating people matters so much? Because we value freedom. Okay, because that wouldn't matter if people, like let's say people valued hair. That was their highest thing. You know, when someone did a crime, they'd take your hair, right? But people value freedom. Okay. So, and it's innate, like it is literally part of who we are. So when someone comes in and they're constantly pushing in on that freedom to, to be and do who we are, again, this is excessive. All right, you guys, it's excessive. Then that can be toxic. So I wanted to address what Trinity was saying where, where Trinity said... I'm really struggling with identifying a red flag right now in a new person in my life. Okay. 
If you're still here, I don't know what you mean by struggling to identify a red flag because red flags are right there. That's what they're doing. They're popping out at you. Okay. They're like glaring. They're obvious. That's what a red flag is. Okay. Then I have what I call the pink flags. And I talk about this in, you learn about this in my course, Self Love to Soulmate Masterclass. I talk about pink flags and pink flags are places that you need more information. You're like, it's places that made you go, hmm, like you're not sure about that thing. I'm not sure what happened there. Or I'm, you know, I'm not really sure. Like, like yesterday, my coaching client called me um, because he's dating someone new and he didn't realize that he called me over a pink flag. But he's like, you know, she asked me this question and she said this. And he's like, that doesn't seem like that seems to me like not right. And yes, he was right. There was, there was, there was an underlying thing that he needs to get more information about. I said, okay, so what you do is you have a conversation You bring it back up again. You say, Hey, remember when you said this, tell me more. So anytime there's something that's not looking right to you in a relationship, I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do a talk on flags, you guys, because I have not done that yet. Flags. Um, anything that doesn't look right to you, like it has a little, like makes you go, hmm, or, ooh, I'm not sure I like that. Or what was that? Please, 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 I'm begging you to listen to those in your dating stages. Listen to those. Get more information. Okay? It's a pink flag. It's showing itself to you. It's an indicator that something might, might be up. It doesn't mean something is up. So let's let's try this on for size. And you know, I really don't like these absolutes that people do. Like, I would never date a mom that li- or a guy that lives with his mother. Why not? Why is he living with his mother? Right? Is it because he's a deadbeat? Is it because he doesn't want to work? Or is it because his mother just went through an awful divorce and she can't make her rent on her own, and he agreed to move in with her? or something like that, right? Or I I knew a guy that went through a divorce, was uh, separated from his wife and his father was dying of cancer. And this guy made bank. He moved back in with his parents. He was living with his parents when I met him. He said, I helped my mom, helped my dad through the cancer. And I'm still living here to, you know, until things get right and then I'll buy my own house. So this is what I'm trying to say. Someone says, yeah, I live with my mom. Pink flag. You need more information. How long have you lived with your mom? Oh, you never moved out. Well, why? You see what I'm saying, you guys? So pink flags are really only designed to to have us pay attention more. And this is one of the most important things that I feel has to do when, when we are dating, that we really need to like get radically clear, talk to people, get information. Know what it is that you want in a person. And don't just take what happened in your past, like Bob lived with his mom and this happened. That doesn't mean if Jim lives with his mom that that's going to happen. You see what I'm saying? And now I'm kind of going into the dating arena, but this had to do with toxic behavior. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to not go, I'm not going to, I am going to refrain from going into the dating arena because we can talk about that at another time. So I just wanted to jump on to really more extensively talk to you guys. Thank you for this information. My husband was a mama's boy. Was it a... Beverly, was it a good mama's boy or a bad mama's boy? Because here's why. My son will stand up and he will go, <laughs> he will say, I, he will stand up in front of anybody. He is six foot two. He's got a massive beard. He's got tattoos. And he will say, I am a mama's boy. But what he's saying with that is, I love my mom. Like I respect the shit out of my mom and I love her. Does he, you know, need to be around me all the time? Does he, no, he's got his own life. He's got his own thing. But yeah, if a mama's boy means that he couldn't make any decisions without her, yeah, yeah. that's something to look at. That makes sense. I appreciate your comment, Beverly. I appreciate all your guys' comments. You know, when you come on here and share stuff with me, it, um, (laughs) always up my butt. (laughs) Yeah. And, and that kind of goes without saying that that needy behavior, um, you know, I didn't mention that because that, that kind of goes into 
um, smothering and insecure. It could go into a lot of these places, but, um, and here's the thing, you guys, I really want everybody to understand this. I want to I try to unpack this in a very clear way. Narcissism, toxic, and healing. Okay, this is where I'm going. Narcissism is really a person who is exhibiting certain traits. Okay, it's a disorder. It's disordered thinking is what it is. It is not genetic. Yes, definitely, I'm exhausted. I know, girl. You need some freedom. Is this your ex-husband or your... I think you said it was your ex-husband. Um, yes, it is exhaust. It is exhausting. I, I'm sending you some vibes, girlfriend, because... I know. I feel your pain. I've been in your position. I get it. So, narcissist is a list... Is a... Is a, a um, it's a conglomeration of a certain types of behaviors, right? Which, which stems from the unhealed... Oh no, your husband at the moment. Okay, good. So I'm hoping that this is helping you. Yes, for sure. Yes. I need to talk about that. I need to talk about that freedom before I hang up. If you can hang out about how she can set boundaries with that. But what narcissism is basically, it's unhealed wounds within, okay, that just manifested on this. Um, it's a hyper independent, it's an all about me, and it's the taker. Okay, where our unhealed, unhealed wounds within, they manifested over here in people pleasing and the over givers. All right, so the, the fact that that person is that way, yes, it's destructive, but also our people pleasing is destructive as well. So we just need to know that. But here's the thing is that, yes, yeah, some people are so deep in the hole, like they could be like a, a stage five narcissist, right? They're so deep in the hole that they're not even close to waking up. They're not even close to an awakening and awareness. They, the pain of staying the same has not gotten bad enough for them to where they're starting to look within. Okay. A lot of people have, I've heard people say that narcissists are unfixable. You just need to leave them. You just need to this. That's not been my experience. However, there, it does come a time if the healing is not happening, you, you might need to leave. Like they could be have these teeny tiny baby steps in the right direction. But if the toxicity of it is too much and it's been too much for too long, yeah, you might just need to leave. Okay, that's, that's a thing. However, toxic behavior, okay, so this is why difficult behavior, destructive behavior, slash unhealthy behavior, toxic is just the catch word everybody uses, right? And that's why I use it because algorithms pick that up. But I like to express what this really means. That type of behavior is also just stemming from unhealed wounds, okay? So a toxic person is not necessarily a narcissist. A narcissist has a particular set of skills. <laughs> they have a particular set of skills that they implement that try to get their way constantly. And it is literally all about them. And I'm not the master expert in um, narcissists. That is Dr. Romani, who's on here and also God, who's that older guy? I love him. He's so cute. His, his, his channel is not his name. And so that's why I never remember it. If I think of it, I'll let you guys know. It's like narcissist awareness or something like that. <laughs> I hate these skills. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a particular set of skills. So I'm getting hot in my car, though. I don't know why the AC. Okay. So with that being said, um, what was I, where was I going with this? All right. But toxic slash unhealthy, slash destructive, those are all healable, all right? Like I said, if your person is floating all of these and then some and the, the gaslighting and all the things that has to do with narcissism, yeah, that's going to be tough. Still requires boundaries. But if you're with someone that's like, you know, they're defensive sometimes and, you know, they can be a little jealous and insecure and Sometimes they're judgmental, you know, those type of things. You got that going on. Usually, that person is aware enough that when you start to really set boundaries with them or have really, really open conversations with them, they'll start to heal. All right? None of us are perfect. We're not perfect. And none of us are coming out of here unscathed without some type of betrayal or trauma or abuse, right? There's so many of us has been through so much, okay? And there's people 
that want better for themselves, but they don't yet know how. So when you start setting and maintaining healthy boundaries with them, that affords a person the opportunity to look at themselves. When I realized that my boundaries served both parties, it blew my mind because I just started setting and maintaining healthy boundaries for me. Remember, I did this healing path. If you listened to yesterday's or the day before is live, I did not have therapist. I was not led through this. I didn't have terminology. I set course to heal and followed my instincts, my intuition, read books, did things, applied things, journaled, walked, meditated, and I started to heal, okay? But when I started setting boundaries and maintaining, because I set boundaries my whole life, that was not a problem. I could speak up for the, for the unacceptable, but it was maintaining them. When I started maintaining my boundaries for me, I wasn't doing it for anybody else. I just needed my peace. The people started to change. They literally, I'm, I'm remembering one person, it, I'm going to tell you the story. It was the, it was the two o'clock in the morning. My daughter um, was waking me up every morning at two o'clock in the morning because at the age she was at and she would go out or she had a boyfriend problem or something and she'd call me and she wanted to talk at two o'clock in the morning, whatever. And I was like, and I would do it. My girlfriend did this too for a time. But anyway, at some point I was like, I can't keep waking up at two o'clock in the morning to do this. I mean, we're just talking about the same stuff all the time. So I set a boundary. And I remember she fought me because she's my kid. She's my baby. And she was like, I can't believe you're not going to, you know, I'm like, you got to stop calling me at two o'clock in the morning, bro. Well, I said it really nicely anyway. But what happened was she started to work through the issues on her own because I was not available. And I was like, as long as she had me to lean on, she wasn't doing the work herself. So I organically understood that my boundaries served both of us. Boundaries serve both parties. This is actually in my, my upcoming book. This is a subchapter in my upcoming book. This is how important this is, you guys. I actually made it its own little subchapter. Okay? So me understanding that, that when I set a boundary that I'm actually, it's actually an act of love. You guys, that made my eyes tear up. It's actually an act of love to set a boundary with someone. Okay? Because not only do you get your needs met, they get to see what they're doing. You're holding a mirror for them. We don't even have to say, we don't have to go, you're being a jerk. Or you're we can just go, here's my boundary. Here's my boundary. Here's my boundary. Eventually they're going to go, well, wait, well, wait a minute. Well, I better not do that or else she's not going to want to be around me. So they take care of the that. And some people won't. This is the truth. Okay. So people who are narcissists, they are, don't give a flying leap about your boundary. They're going to, they're going to mow over that thing. They do not care. I just literally had a visual in my head of a boundary and like this big, massive, like dump truck just flying over it. They don't care. They have zero regard for your boundary because all they care about, this is people on the, yes, Haley, big facts. Beverly, thank you. Yes. They will blow over your boundary like it's nothing, which leaves, I don't know about you guys, but that left me hurt and confused. Because I was like, because I projected that this person would heed my boundary because I heed people's boundaries. So I was like, and when I started to understand that the man I was married to really didn't give a crap, he didn't care about my feelings. He didn't care about anything to do with me. Like I literally was in this marriage, sleeping with this person, doing the things, paying the bills, making the things, having the baby. And he really didn't care. He really didn't care because I wasn't doing things that were dastardly. I'm a really, you can, you can ask my friends that are on right now. I am a really easygoing person. I dot my I's and cross my T's. I pay my bills. I'm neat. I'm tidy. I'm sexual. I'm, I'm, I'm easygoing. I'm, you know, I'm an easygoing person. So when that was happening, I was like, I didn't cause that. 
this is why I mean my path was so organic because I asked so many, I'm like, what the hell is happening here? I never heard the word narcissism. I just heard that a couple years ago, to be honest with you guys. And this whole thing happened 12 years ago. Like I said yesterday, I thought he was an alcoholic. I thought that was the problem. And I went to Al-Anon, families and friends of, of addicts. I went to Al-Anon. Um, that wasn't it. <laughs> that was a symptom of a bigger problem. But my point is, is that they're going to mow over you and they're not going to care. And it's going to, at first, it's going to surprise you. All right. But what that means is you got to up your boundary. You got to up your boundary. If they're going to mow over that one, you get a bigger one. You make a boundary until it is a brick effing wall that they can't get through. And this is what happens. Then they start going, they start noticing this and they start noticing you pulling away and they start noticing these bigger boundaries. And then now they're really up in their game because what is this? Who do you think you are that you're going to do this? Who do I think I am? Baby boundary didn't work with you. Medium boundary didn't work with you. Large boundary didn't work with you. Now you get the Mac Daddy. And sometimes that Mac Daddy is leaving. Okay? Sometimes that is the ultimate boundary, is to leave. That's up to you. We don't, you know. Here's the other thing I want people to know. Um, You're going to know when it's time. Okay? You're going to know when this friend or partner or parent or whatever, you're going to know when that relationship has expired. Something's going to click. A lot of times it happens after you've done all the necessary boundaries. Because we're still kind of in it when we don't set the boundaries yet because we're not really sure. Like there's a part of us that knows we're not complete But when you set and set and set and set and set the boundaries and you decrease, 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 decrease the time together with this person and the stuff's still going on and you're like, I think think it's time. Only you're going to know that. And a lot of times people want to surround us and say, you got to leave, got to go. What are you doing? If you're not ready for that, you're just going to come back. I, as a coach and as a mentor, I, 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 unless it's physical, actually physical violence, you guys, I, I, I will verbally say you need to get the, the heck out of there. Whether you do or not is on you, but that's something that is a, that is a slam dunk for me because I know that that can escalate into greater, greater things that can, that can really escalate into really bad things. But other than that, I am not going to be so bold as to know your spiritual journey and where your exit point is. Just like people didn't know for me. Okay? But when we know, we know. And sometimes we, gotta need, we need to get a little stronger. We need to get a little bit more empowered. Pout, empowered. Empowered. Sometimes enough has got to be enough. Like that click will happen, that box will happen. Okay, so I wanted to talk about this real quick before I left. Um, I think this was the freedom that Beverly was was talking about, that her husband's up her ass. Um, Beverly, I don't know you. I don't know what you've tried so far. I don't know where you're at with this. So I am just going to tell you what what I believe helps, and then you can take it from there to see if this works for you, if you're still here listening. The, the head, little head thing doesn't tell me who's exactly here still. So the first, th- the first step is talking about it with the person. Okay, always the first step, communication. And we do it in a non-attacking way. Okay, okay, right on, Beverly. We do it in a non-attacking way. We say, hey, this is how I'm feeling. I'm feeling smothered. I'm feeling like, you know, you're always with me. I require some alone time. Um, you're, you're talking my language, girl. I've had to have this conversation myself because I... I need my alone time. Like I need my space to revamp and to refuel. And the thing is, I don't need a lot of it. It seems as though the more that I'm smothered, the more that I need it. So it's kind of like if people just let me come and go, I don't really need a lot of it. I just need that flow space. So it's important to have the conversation with the persons first. Um, The other day I was needing alone time. I was needing that freedom. And my eldest daughter texted me or called me. And 
then my youngest did and was in the home or coming home or I don't remember it, but I said to both of them, I said, unless this is the 911, I need to postpone a conversation with you guys because I really need some time alone. They both said, cool. They both understood. So the conversation is always first, right? Um, refrain from making them wrong. It, this is about what you need. This is not about what they're doing, okay? So we have to say that I need space. I need time. I need air. I need to flow. I need whatever it might be for me, okay? First thing is with that. The second thing is that if that doesn't happen, right, they're still doing the same things. To me, this is another conversation saying, hey, what's going on? I've requested this. This is not happening. And in this process, I would love for you to get into the mind of your person because they could be doing this because they feel like they're supposed to be doing it. Like that's their job as a partner. I've heard that. I've seen that. So he could be like, Oh, you mean I don't need to follow you around? You mean I don't need to, could be some wounding from his past. No, you don't. Oh, you mean I can, I can do whatever I want? You mean, you know? So you don't know. So, so really look at it as a conversation, okay? And, and get into the heart and mind of your person as well. But then it's gonna require boundaries. I am going to the grocery store alone. I am going to, but the, 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 alone. Well, we're a couple and we need to do everything together and we need to do this. No, if you need more people time, then perhaps go hang out with your friend. Because the truth is that couples don't need to be up each other's butts. They don't. One of the happily married people that I know in my life that had been married for a very, very, very long time, I asked the wife one day, it was a long time ago, and I said, um, I said, you guys seem so happily married. You know, how, what's the key? Do you have a key? What's, what's going on here? And she said, we have our own lives. We have our separate lives, the separate things that we do. Okay, like she does crocheting and he does golf or whatever. We have our separate things that we do, but then we come together for other things. She says, we have our separate lives and we have our together lives. And to me, this is what I'm talking about where earlier I said about therapists and whatever. That's wisdom. I'll take wisdom any day. Okay? This is 60 years married or whatever. That was the smartest thing I'd ever heard. They're not up each other's butts. They have their own separate things and then they have their, their together time. And a lot of times, let's say, if couples have retired, they're around each other a lot or one works from home or, you know, those type of things. It's going to be on us, the people that are feeling smothered, that need to forge the break or to um, create the space because we can't expect them to do it if they have some unconscious reason why they're doing this okay they're not even conscious about it and they don't see it as a problem okay so this is where we have to take radical responsibility for self and we have to set and maintain a healthy boundary where necessary okay it's not about them it's about us what are we allowing so I hope that makes sense, Beverly. That is what I have for you. If you, if you have any more questions regarding that, please let me know real soon because I'm going to hop off here pretty quick. So, um, yeah. All right, you guys. So this was a very random conversation. I made my list on the back of a receipt. I went to Zumba this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. I appreciate you. Um, I had to go run to a store and I just made a little list and thought I'd jump on real quick with you guys. I really appreciate when you guys jump on these lives with me. I love the interactions because truthfully, I want to get to know you guys. I mean, I want us to be a community. I want us to support each other. And a lot of times people write stuff in the chat that supports somebody else. You know, it doesn't all need to come from me. Yes, I'm a coach. Yes, I'm a mentor. Yes, I'm an author. Yes, I'm a speaker. Yes, I'm all those things. And we jive together. Okay. People are stronger together. Have you heard better together? <laughs> we are better together, right? I just got done watching The Walking Dead and every time, you know, as a community, they were better together than the times that they had gone off being solo. So my whole point here is eventually, I think what I'm gonna do, you guys, to be honest, is once I, my book is published, which should be very soon, I'm gonna start a, what do they call it? Subscription, like class, where we all can meet up like once a week 
It'll be for like a nominal fee and we can talk about everything regarding the book, everything relationships, everything about boundaries, everything about self-love. And we can even go through the book chapter by chapter. I'm not sure how I'm gonna do it yet. I haven't come up with that yet. But this book is such an amazing text and it's very simply written, just so you guys know. It's not like a bunch of complicated stuff because I don't write that way, I don't talk that way. And, but questions arise on the healing path, right? And we need to be reminded of something. And sometimes somebody else's story makes sense because a lot of times when we're going through something in life, there's not a lot of people around us that are going in our, in our periphery that are going through it. Like they have other stuff, but they don't, they don't, they can't really relate to what we're going through because they haven't been there. And then we're going to these people for opinion and advice and it just doesn't make sense or they just don't quite get it. You know that feeling of, they just don't quite get it. I know that feeling. Okay. Because like, even like as an author writing or having creative flow, if someone doesn't do stuff like that, they're not going to get it when I'm talking about certain things to do with that. They just don't, they're like, they can kind of, kind of understand. But so I'm, I really just throwing this around right now. One thing you guys will learn about me is that the way I roll in life is I roll through flow. I roll through God guiding me because I know that you know, the best laid plans, right? They never work out because we're trying to how our way through life. We're trying to, you know, automaton and robot our way through life and thinking that we can control everything. When I let go, let my hands off the wheel and I surrender, what happens is that I'm guided. And right now I'm kind of feeling like inspired to do that. It feels like guidance. It feels like inspiration. So after my book is published, you guys can look forward to that. If that's something you would like to do where we meet up as a community and we chat once a week and I may probably deliver some type of lesson or something. I think that would be really fun. So I just want to thank everybody who came on today, who came through this room, who listened, who talked, who chimed in, who, who chatted. And um, thank you guys so much for being here. And if you have any topics that you would like me to address in a live, then let me see. Can you guys type them in the community tab? I think you can. You can probably type a re Maybe not. I guess just put it in, one, in the... Uh, comments of one of my lives. Just say, hey, can you ad address this particular topic in one of your lives? I also do it on the Dear KB thing, but I kind of like answering questions as if you were in the room with me and I'm talking to you. So either way is fine though. All right, you guys have an amazing Saturday if you're here in the United States and uh, a Northern, you know, Western Hemisphere. Have an amazing Saturday and I look forward to our next conversation. Much love everybody. Bye.